Well, I mean, my, 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 my real hope is that um, it, there could be a kind of uh, supersession of one sort of form of consciousness and its realization to a different way of being. Much like the metaphor of a snake uh, shedding its skin, you know, so that we're, we might actually be in the shedding process right now, that we don't totally, we're not totally aware of it. And it's actually like, you know, in, in the kind of counterculture realm, there's a lot of anger against the system and, and, and the sense that they want to almost want to see things melt down and go crazy. And I don't share that at all. I think we really want the system to hold together, just like with the, when a snake is shedding its skin. You need that old skin to stay in place uh, long enough to allow the new skin to form. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a dead snake, you know. So... Um, I think that 2008 really, you know, many things suggest that might be a critical uh, threshold. Uh, you know, there was this Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has his piece in Rolling Stone a couple weeks ago about uh, the, the electronic voting machines and the sense that um, there's a lot of questions about, about, about how those are, are operating, you know, and this continual scandals and crises and the ecological crisis intensifying, the government's incapacity to kind, to kind of address it in any meaningful way, the military crises intensifying. Um, it, it, just, it just seems that the um, uh, system is m- moving towards a kind, a kind of reckoning, you know. And uh, it, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, so, yeah. A, a gentle uh, scenario and then, then a shift into, into a different kind of order of consciousness. And uh, I think that we're going to be forced, I think that we're in this kind of birth canal now, you know, that uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, higher mind of our species is being born, but it's going through this, you know, like a birth canal, this constrained, dark tunnel process first. Um, you know, I was very interested in um, the idea of the apocalypse. I didn't really just talk about that so much, but... Uh, the Jungian perspective on the apocalypse is that it's the um, uh, momentous event of the coming of the self into conscious realization. And so the individual uh, goes to their own apocalyptic process. And it's a word that means, you know, connotates, connotates disaster and cataclysm, but also revealing and opening. So it's a time of, of, of uh, tremendous revealing, where all the things that were hidden get kind of uh, displayed. And to me, that seems to be like, a, a very uh, powerful aspect of what's happening right now. There's, there's a sense that nothing can really stay hidden, you know, like everything just keeps coming out. It's like that, the, the karmic elastic band is just snapping back faster and faster, you know. Oh, sorry, sorry, first. I don't know if that really answered your question. But. <laughs> I could go more specifically. I just wondered in your um, research and travels if you'd come across Richard Tarnas. And his, uh, of course, his first book, very scholarly, was The Passion of the Western Mind. But his new book, uh, just this year, is, it, called Cosmos and Psyche, um, actually aligns and perhaps in, in, um, augments all that you are talking about um, because he's actually taking um, a look at history and how cycles re- return uh, actually, through the view of astrology, mm-hmm. and uh, the the year t- two thousand eight is uh, significant as as is twenty twelve, and um, the significance of uh, what you uh, referred to, uh, and a number of alignments, all of which um, are you know are seem to pattern the same way that you're speaking, and and the patterning, I, I, I first want to. Um, thank you for your emphasis because I feel like this is very true for me. Uh, incidentally, I am an astrologer, a, professional, a certified professional astrologer. Um, but the patterning to me is that there is always a breakdown before there is a breakthrough. And so that same thing that you're talking about, uh, and, and I think you'd find Richard Tarnas's book fascinating. I, know, I, re- I read his book, and I, and I wrote about a, his book. I wrote a piece about it, and I actually interviewed him in California, and I hung out. And I think it's a great book. I was actually going to tell you about it, Cosmos and Psyche. It's this, uh, he looks at the, um, out, the outer planet um, transits in relationship to human history, um, Uranus, Pluto, Neptune, and Saturn, and... Um, the, the evidence is very suggestive that somehow these, these outer planets as archetypes are somehow 
connected to cycles in human history. So, and the need for psyche to return to the cosmos, which is also your theme. Right. Well, so so it's really I think um, beautiful, and it's a very Jungian vision. So so um, the idea is that uh, there are these archetypes that are represented by the planets. And if they're not consciously understood and mediated, they tend to take on their most destructive aspects. You know, so he talks about we're currently, we've been in a, a, new, a Neptune-Saturn conjunction, I think, right? So, so Neptune-Saturn, Neptune represents kind of a, sp- sort of a, the, the spiritual impulse, the impulse to merge, to dissolve boundaries. Uh, Saturn uh, is densification, uh, melancholy often, uh, the kind of father or authority figure. Um, so Saturn, Neptune, you know, when we have like the uh, uh, tsunami uh, or the New Orleans flood, a kind of perfect, I mean, almost amazingly perfect Saturn, Neptune events where it's this kind of literalization of, of, of melancholy through floodwaters, you know, and destruction, uh, tearing, you know, taking things apart. Um, but Saturn-Neptune is also a conjunction that appears in a lot of uh, astrological charts of amazing people. So you have like Robert F. Kennedy, the, the senior. Uh, I think it was Gandhi also had Saturn-Neptune. And there, Saturn acts as the kind of uh, disciplining element, which allows the, uh, this sort of spiritual or mystical component to have a real grounding and force. So and we're coming, as, as she pointed out, to, through a number of major alignments in the next few years, and, and really thinking about understanding what these kind of archetypal conjunctions mean and how we can mediate them consciously and give them their most positive spin rather than just being like subjected to them negatively. I don't know. It, it, may, it may be a crucial piece of the puzzle for, for uh, getting through uh, this transition properly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I really appreciate your... Um use of the word we, very powerful two-letter word that you use about this psychic way that we're going to evolve as a we. And my experience has been that um, there's such a strong fundamentalist force, there's a dualistic force in this world of us and them. Right now, the apocalypse is being described between the Christians and the Muslims. I mean, there's such a force of dualism in this world. And I'm really wondering if we are really going to be psychically moving in this or if just some of us are going to be psychically moving and maybe not all of us are. And what that is going to create as we uh, move through this birth canal that you described. I mean, I really wonder that, too. Um, um, I think it's a really crucial question. I mean, Jose Arguelles, who's this uh, Mayan calendar visionary that I write about in the book, when I went and saw him, he was like, because he, he's created his own 13 moon calendar, which I ended up critiquing in the book, but he was like, oh, we're moving, we're moving from, you know, this sort of physical realm to the newosphere, this kind of mind of the, of, the, of the planet is connecting with the human mind, and, you know, by... 2008, we're going to start taking down the technosphere. We're going to realize that it was a mistake. We're going to remove a lot of our technology. We're going to create a garden planet, go into telepathic seances. It's going to be great. You know? And I was like, Jose, are you out of your mind? Like, everybody's like, about to kill each other. You know? Everyone's at each other's throat. The whole thing is falling apart. And he was like, look, I'm a visionary. And my job as a visionary is to envision the best possible outcome for humanity. And that really resonated with me. And the more I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, that's like a really good job. And I'm going to like make that <laughs> my job too, you know. <laughs> you know, because like, there's enough people who are always like, oh, it's four billion people are going to be annihilated by the meteorite and the flood's going to come and the perfect superstorm is going to hit, you know, and the magnetic pole. So it's like, maybe, you know, but, but maybe we're learning that our intention is so integral to, to actually what can take place and what can manifest. So my intention is that everybody gets through the shift. You know, we get like, you know, Bush and Osama's brother will be like hugging each other in three years and, you know, they'll make up and they'll realize they're all on the same path and, you know, it's a big mistake and, you know, we'll just, we'll just move into this higher level of consciousness. I mean, that's, you know, I don't see why not. Like, why not just put out the best possible vision of, of possibility and then somebody else can, you know, do the other thing, you know, the, you know. <laughs> Daniel, I um, commend you for your, your talk. I love the talk about the pineal gland as the teacher of Kundalini Yoga. I love that meditation stuff. And as a libertarian, I like your private sector solution to get your students to be more conscious purchasers for sustainable products. 
One challenging question I have for you is the title of your book, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. A lot of controversial authors uh, for, uh, that have studied all the ancient cultures say there will be a return of Quetzalcoatl and other gods. Uh, you can, you know, Sitchin from the Sumerian tablets, that kind of thing. Uh, I, want, I want you to talk about that title, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. How do you explore the idea that there will be a return of certain people or those kinds of controversial theories? Um, yeah, good question. I, I, have you read the book yet? I guess not. Uh, uh, love to buy it. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, well, um, so, yeah, I mean, that refers to, I mean, Quetzalcoatl symbolizes, you know, the, the bird and the snake meeting. Quetzal is the Quetzal bird and Coat is the serpent. So the bird obviously represents air, you know, the, the element that can defy gravity and weight, spirit. Snake is the slithering being of earth and matter. So it's the integration of spirit and matter, heaven and earth, okay? Um, so for me, that, that as, as an archetype, that really represents what we're trying to do here. If you take the uh, kind of intuitive, shamanic, and mystical kind of way of being and knowing, uh, and the empirical, materialist, scientific way of, of knowing, that's, that's what's trying to be woven together, uh, right? That, that, for me, is what 2012 was all about. So as those two come together, that's we, then we move into this next uh, form of consciousness. So that's what Quetzalcoatl uh, represents. Uh, and I also had a, in the late part of the book, I have actually a, a personal experience when I was working in the Amazon with ayahuasca of receiving this whole transmission about the return of Quetzalcoatl and my own place as one like holder of that energy and helping to like bring that process forward, uh, which was actually which was a, a difficult and fascinating experience. And um, also like now that I'm sort of still reflecting upon it, just really like what is a god form or a deity? You know, like what is the the Buddha of compassion that the Dalai Lama carries? I mean, they're kind of like these. Uh, Archetypes. Um, I mean, the, Jung has this idea that there's this kind of domain of the archetypes that uh, are just interacting with, with our more kind of like um, kind of uh, contained human reality over, over time and in different ways. So, um, does that help? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in the yoga, the serpent is the Kundalini, the serpent that you awaken and rise to reach the bird, the lotus, the top, the, uh, yeah. the yoga land. But other authors have talked about the reality of those gods, including Quetzalcoatl. Have you talked about what? Other authors have talked about the reality of these gods, like Quetzalcoatl, even equating them as the same god as Toth from the Egyptians, uh, or the same god as somebody else with the, the Vedic culture. I'm wondering if you explore that angle at all from the wording of the title, the actual entities that these gods represented. The actual entities, and I, I, what I'm telling you is I think that they're more like these kind of uh, archetypal, conceptual kind of uh, complexes that come in, that, that interact with the human psyche uh, over, over a historical process uh, and that come in in different ways. So Quetzalcoatl yeah, has, a rep, rec, you know, has some connection to some of the gods you mentioned, also to you know, the, the Christ consciousness. A lot of people see a rec, uh, connection there. Um, yeah, and, and certainly a good representation of, of the awakening of Kundalini, hitting the crown chakra and the thousand petal flower feather thing opening up. You know. I wanted to thank you because I think something that you've brought with this book as a journalist versus as a quote unquote scientific expert, is an opening for a conversation on a much broader level on a lot of a lot of these areas. And I think probably everybody in this room has had some sort of personal experience at some level with something you touch on in this book. Um, but that it opens up a much broader conversation. And something that very much touched me was that the I don't know, somewhere around three quarters of the way into the book with your final questioning about crop circles and this, this, this lack of absolute knowing that you come with, that you're still in the question. Um, but you came up with this realization, I think, that touches back on to the idea with the birth canal, that, um, that pretty much what you come to the question with, your intentionality, is what you're going to receive, whether or not if you're coming with a... Um, 
cynical mind, you're going to get um, data that supports that thesis. And, and if you